Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the start of yet another important event in today's agenda, and that is the Symposium 1. The topic will be a uh, well-spoken of, a popular topic, and yet, uh, yet important due to the uh, nature of its con continuous evolvement. Uh, and to chair the session, let me invite uh, Dr. Angela Arul Pragasam, the Dean of the Faculty of Healthcare Sciences, Sciences at the Eastern University, and also a consultant pediatrician at the Teaching Hospital of Batiklu, and to join her, Dr. P. Mayuratan, consultant physician at the Teaching Hospital of Batiklu. Hope the session will be, hope the session will reignite your passion in continuous medical education and evidence-based learning. Thank you. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We warmly welcome you all to the first symposium. COVID-19, the combat and the consequences. We have four eminent speakers today. Uh, I would like to introduce the first speaker, Dr. K. Arul, <coughs> Arul Molly. He's a senior consultant physician at Teaching Hospital Batiklo. He graduated from Faculty of Medicine, Colombo uh, in 1998 and he obtained his MD medicine in 2004. Uh, he has uh, FCCP, FRCP, Edinburgh, uh, and also he is the past president of Batiklo Medical Association. He is a postgraduate examiner and member of board of study in medicine and member of expert committee in Dengu. I welcome Dr. Arul Molly for the first presentation. Over to you, sir. Good morning to you all. Thank you, my brother, for the kind introduction. My topic is how did we combat uh, COVID-19, our experience. So in fact, we are at the crossroads. We don't know whether really we combated COVID or we are heading towards Omicron, no. But for the time being, we can see few people are without masks, so we combated COVID at a certain level. So we had a meeting in 2020, January, regarding COVID preparation. January 2020. We went, ma the, we went to the meeting without mask. So no COVID in Sri Lanka at that time. So I, I said in that meeting, prepare for the worst, hope for the best. So it was an interesting meeting, a lot of arguments, and few people said it's not a severe disease, you can tackle very easily, but so history taught us a different thing. Listen to science. So as you all know, pandemic started. Various people have started various talks, came with various ideas, religious talks, natures, uh, native medicine, and so on and so forth. But few people listened to the science, they combated COVID. Decisions should be informed by care professional. So if you leave others to take decision, not going to help. Quick testing is important, as our earlier speaker also said. Quick testing is important to categorize people, identify people, isolate people and to detect variants. Ramp up of storing of PPE. Earlier, even there was controversy in mask, whether you, you can use this mask, this, that mask, PPE. So it's, you know now the real situation. Provide clear, consistent, evidence-based guidance for how communities should navigate the pandemic. That is a prevention part. So we, uh, we as clinicians, we didn't involve much to the preventive part, but we gave advice how to navigate through the pandemic. 
So you must tell community the real thing. So you can't lie, you can't tell one thing today, tomorrow one thing. So it occurred in Australia also. Australia, at start they said, AstraZeneca, we will not give AstraZeneca vaccine for you all. You take Pfizer or something. Then they, no, short, no vaccines. They released AstraZeneca for everyone. People didn't go. So they earlier said that AstraZeneca has some problem. So you have to tell clearly and it should be consistent and evident. As you all know, it's virus. COVID is virus, highly infectious, respiratory root, deaths and severe complications. And the behavior of virus mostly unknown. You, you, whether you like it or not, mostly unknown. We don't know how to sometimes infect others also. People will come and say, I never gone outside, but got the virus. So it's behavior of virus is mostly unknown, and so post effect and immune reactions are variable and sometimes life threatening. So epidemiology of COVID-19. So you must know the epidemiology of COVID-19. So that is what we said in the last, uh, the very first meeting. Look at the history. This is Spanish flu in 1914. So we had a lot of experience in the past. Still we are unprepared or underprepared. So prepare for the worst. So we had in the past. Still we are struggling. This is early 19... I would say 1919, December, yeah. December in Wuhan. Roads were deserted, locked down. We were hanging around and we were enjoying here in Sri Lanka. It's 2019, December. So we didn't look at the countries suffered from COVID-19. So early, late 19 uh, and early 2020s. So low, Wuhan, whole Wuhan city province was locked down. They were washing the roads and so we laughed at them. So, so you had learned from them. You had learned from other countries, learned from the severity of disease. So you should prepare. So this is again a history, black death killed more than 200 million in 1300s. Smallpox killed 56 million. Spanish flu killed 45 million. HIV killed recently in 1981, 30 million. COVID-19, so for 5 million, uh, compared to those past few numbers. But for the modern world, is significant number. So uh, this is a R0 factor. It's R0 factor or an R0 factor. This is a, it's a factor of contagious, how severe the virus is contagious. How, how contagious is the virus? So this is, if you can see, This is in uh, first December 1990. They faced out the R0 factor in China. This is in China. Uh, face to face, they calculate the R0 factor. How severe, how contagious is the virus? We didn't realize. So R0 is very high in February. So it's so it's because uh, they calculate the population, how can they, uh, and, and uh, calculate the R0 factor. So in Omicron also, I, will, I would ask what the R0 factor. So if R0 factor is very high, very contagious, it will spread like nothing. If Delta virus, R0 factor, gone up to 
some say seven, eight. So one person can infect the virus to seven people. So if you know the Omicron, you can guess how uh, severe the, the transmission will be. Epidemiological pattern, severity among different ages. So when it comes to clinical settings, so we need all these epidemiological patterns. So ages, this young age, nothing happened, in fact. 20s, 10, 20s, no deaths, no complications. So you should know the epidemiological pattern. Otherwise, it's difficult to treat. You can't admit each and every patient to the hospital and treat, or keep in the isolation ward also. Severity among comorbid patients. That is also important. Pathophysiology of disease itself. Study from, as I said, study from other countries. Pathophysiology, so, so this is incubation period, viral RNA in the blood, viral symptoms, early inflammatory phase, secondary infection, multi-system inflammatory phase. So if you know the pathophysiology is easy to treat. So once patient admitted, it's easy to navigate your treatment. So this is again the pathophysiology with the action model. So vaccine monoclonal antibody is very early, immune modulators little bit late, and IVIG and all those things later than that. So admission, as I said, whether to admit every patient or selected patient. Earlier, we didn't know anything about this virus. We admitted all the patients to the hospital. And all wards were full, isolation unit were full. We couldn't tackle whom to take care, whom to give preference. So the later we understood young people, less complications. So we didn't admit young people. Whether it's symptomatic or asymptomatic. Asymptomatic people, less complication. We didn't admit. So symptomatic, symptomatic people only admitted. Symptomatic, asymptomatic. So again, comorbidities. Elderly with comorbidities, definitely problem. So elderly, more than 50s, 60s with diabetes, more complications. So we admitted all the patients with elderly and comorbidities. Hypertension, again problem. Lot of complications. We don't know whether it's due to the AC inhibitor. Most of the people are on AC, were on AC inhibitors and ARBs. Don't know whether it's due to that treatment or hypertension itself. COPD, obviously it's a lung disease. Again, COVID is also uh, lung complications. CKD, investigations. So as I said, the latter part of the disease, we struggle a lot handling pandemic. We categorize the patient. We didn't admit young people. So we have sent back young people, all young people to home isolation. We didn't admit asymptomatic patients. We sent all, most all the patients to home or peripheral centers. So we admitted only the elderly with comorbidities or elderly people. We did all, on admission, we did full blood count, CRP, blood sugar, chest x-ray. On admission, each and every patient we did to see the baseline value. Otherwise, it's difficult to see the changes later on when they develop complications. So again, we did X-ray on fifth day of admission to see whether they develop any lung complications. In developed countries, straight away they did HRCD, but here we did chest X-ray on fifth day of admission to see any, whether they develop any lung, obvious lung complications in addition to that. Mainly because we 
Healthcare workers entered to the patient room with all full PP. Difficult to listen to the lung, difficult to examine, lot of restrictions. So we mainly depend on investigations and monitoring. Treatment, of course, almost all uh, diabetic patients have put on insulin from day one. So we have changed the non-ACE uh, inhibitors, ARBs, antihypertensive to other treatments, and we started inhalers, not the nebulizers. Uh, not the last, this is. Uh, healthcare workers, so in addition to that, uh, we failed in some aspect because we didn't inform all the healthcare workers, we didn't, we didn't educate all the healthcare workers about COVID-19. Mostly because we also didn't know about the virus, what will happen and how trans. So, however, we would have educated very well about this disease. Health cover should be informed about the changes. All the health cover, because otherwise they will not come to the work. They have put sick leave sometime. Nobody was there. Doctors jumped out. So you should inform them. And you should reassure them. And should be protected. So we were telling most of the time, protect healthcare workers. So the current context is different. We have got the vaccine, fortunately. So before vaccine, we were struggling. So it should be protected. So you should provide good PPE, good protection. You can't ask people to go, healthcare workers to go without good protection. Should be supported. So government has taken a lot of steps to support healthcare workers and as well as we. And uh, should be incorporated in decision making. Healthcare workers all should be incorporated in health decision making. And also should be considered. So this is mainly overview of how did we come back COVID-19, but there are a lot of, I didn't go to in, in the inside the, the very details aspect. So overall picture is that. So if you, if you have any questions, you can ask. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arun Moli. Uh, that was an enlightening um, speech on how uh, what are the challenges the hospital or Batiklo faced? Uh, I, the, for, the forum is open for questions. We can take a few questions. Uh, while you prepare for your questions, can I ask uh, one question? <clears throat> now, uh, you have uh, uh, mentioned the steps uh, or the, the problems that we have faced. Uh, can you mention a few things um, what you would consider as success stories uh, during this pandemic in our context? In our context, success story is to categorize patient. At one point, we couldn't tackle admission. Because of the Delta variant season, we couldn't tackle admission. Lot of admission, no place to admit the patient. So you can't admit here and there. So there should be an isolated ward with all the facilities. So doctor should go. So in should be there, out should be there, and there are a lot of things should be done. So all of a sudden we decided not to admit young people and not to admit uh, young people without any comorbidities. So we have sent all the patient home. Isolation. So we have relieved little bit, and one thing is that, and other thing, uh, we got a trial evidence of uh, treatment. Recovery trial is done 
in Western countries. Short dexamethasone IV injection is very helpful and prevent deaths and complication in COVID lung complication. So we have taken that and we have started treating patient with dexamethasone and other enoxaparinate. So recovery trial mainly dexamethasone. Excellent, excellent result. But people died not because of uh, poor response to dexamethasone, because of late presentation, very, very high blood sugars on admission, defaulted uh, treatment for comorbidities. Those are the main cause for death. All, as far as I can remember, all patients, almost all patients who came early developed lung complications, survived. Survived. No one died. Those who have died are late presenters, late comers to the hospital, and severe complication, comorbid complication, or defaulted treatment for comorbid. So we have started treatment with dexamethasone and other enoxaparin and tocilizumab. It saved a lot of people, saved a lot of people. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Armoli. That was <clears throat> quite reassuring. So <clears throat> I should uh, thank and congratulate the teams who were involved in managing all these admissions uh, during this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Armoli. Now we move on to the next uh, part of this symposium. And our next speaker is none other than Dr. Amita Fernando. He will be joining online with us. He's a consultant respiratory physician at National Hospital Sri Lanka. And he has been the past president of Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists and a past vice president of Sri Lanka Medical Association and a council member of the CCP. Uh, he is the Editor-in-Chief of Asthma and COPD Guidelines of Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists. And he is a, a trainer, a, a experienced trainer in uh, respiratory uh, medicine. So let me invite uh, Dr. Amita Fernando to deliver his uh, address. Thank you. Uh, thank you for those kind words of introduction. Good morning uh, and a warm welcome and warm greetings to you all. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege uh, to be with you on this uh, the medical clinical sessions. Uh, I'm also proud to say that my senior registrar, Dr. Rishit Kishoran Sundaranga, uh, served at Teaching Hospital Batiklo, and I think he made an immense contribution to develop respiratory services there. Uh, Dr. Armoli set the foundation for my talk. Uh, he described the pathophysiology of COVID and the various stages, the viremic phase, the pulmonary phase, which can be complicated by system and also uh, the tendency for, uh, for clotting or prothrombotic state which exists throughout the disease process, even very late in the disease. Uh, also, the various complications of the immediate post-COVID period where fibrosis uh, mo mostly organized can set in, and of course the infective complications and uh, the complications, as Dr. Arul Moli highlighted, resulting from uh, the comorbid diseases, which resulted in excess of deaths. And he also highlighted the important uh, the, the challenges they had to face in organizing delivery of services. I've had also um, the Sundaration about patients, and I'm happy to be of, uh, even a little bit of help. And I'm happy that I was able to, even in a little bit of way, to contribute and in those discussions. In my talk, I'm going to focus, focus on a little less spoken area uh, of uh, 
breathing pattern disorders in the post covid period to illustrate in my talk I'm presenting some illustrative case histories a single center experience on data some definitions classification of this breathing pattern disorders and what long covid and dysfunctional breathing means some tools of evaluation and the role of cardiopulmonary exercise testing in dysfunctional breathing and tools like capnography and a uh, few management strategies <laughs> to illustrate my case um, my first patient is a 39 year old male mild covid disease who presented who had covid in august 2021 home quarantine for 18 days she pre presented with complaint of increasing breathlessness need to take a conscious effort to breathe mouth breathing more than nose breathing uh, felt easier for her she had also difficulty in breathing out uh, on observation, we used this breathing pattern, Brompton breathing pattern disorder tool, which I'll speak of later. She had mainly a abdominal and apical breathing pattern. Uh, there were desperate movements were silent, but she mouth uh, she was mouth breathing most of the time. And she experienced she ex during the period of observation, uh, she demonstrated signs of air hunger, which I will explain later. Uh, there was deep sign and yawning and effortful breathing. Her uh, investigation, like chest X-ray, ECG high resolution CT scans, D dimers were normal, and spirometric and other investigation, six minute walking test did not show any significant change. Right. Second case is also 53 year old female with comorbid diseases, this time of hypertension and ischemic heart disease. My experience is global sensation. Uh, we have also seen patients with laryngeal hypersensitivity and upper airway symptoms post COVID. Maybe they had subclinically these diseases but manifested post COVID. Uh, global sensation is an abnormal sensation in the throat to where you feel a lump in your throat. There is no physical obstruction, but there is merely a sensation. She was short of breath when speaking. She had a feeling of inadequacy of breath, uh, breath not fully filling her chest. She had to take deep breaths. Uh, and often felt tired and fatigued. She also had a predominantly apical breathing pattern. Uh, she was not nose breathing, but during the period of observation, using this BPAT tool or Brompton breathing pattern assessment tool, uh, she de demonstrated signs, uh, signs of air hunger. Her objective investigations were normal. The third case is also a 40 year old male uh, who also had mild COVID disease, re referred to our respiratory unit. Uh, he had deep sighing, difficult and noisy breathing at times, feeling of constant need to take deep breaths and a feeling of fatigue. Uh, she, he also demonstrated a predominantly uh, a abdominal breathing pattern this time, this time but she, he also exposed, he demonstrated symptoms of air hunger. Her objective assessments were normal. So what do our patients with post-COVID breathing pattern disorders say? When I speak of post-COVID breathing pattern disorders, I'm not going, I'm not Talking of the more serious ones, which you have to exclude, of course, uh, where uh, thromboembolism, organizing pneumonia, pulmonary fibrosis, and uncontrolled uh, pre existing comorbid disease can uh, give rise to uh, breathing uh, breathlessness. Uh, organic disorders have to be excluded, and you should be able to pick up red flags in such instances. And also, you shouldn't forget uh, the risk of infection. Some of these patients have high doses of steroids. We have gone on to big doses of steroids sometimes, except well BD. Some of these patients have had methylprednisone pulses for presumed organizing pneumonia. So sepsis and other organic diseases must be excluded. Uh, most of these say, patients say that they cannot breathe. Their breath is not satisfying or fulfilling. They, talk, they cannot take a breath that fills their chest. They demonstrate fe uh, fe features of air hunger. They have an excessive need to breathe. And also they experience symptoms of restriction, uh, mainly may, maybe in the throat and also in the thoracic cavity, where they say that uh, the chest is, they are unable to fill their chest with a good breath. They are unable to take a satisfying breath. They say that air gets stuck uh, somewhere in the region of their throat, throat or chest. They feel exhausted and they tend to hyperventilate also during exercise and in anticipation of exercise. So they have the symptoms of air hunger, which can be assessed by objective tools. And they also have symptoms of restriction, where they, there is restriction to movement in which they experience or feel restriction of movement of air in and out of the chest. Uh, they also experience non-respiratory symptoms like neurological symptoms of headache, palpitations, dizziness, brain fog, fog or clouding of uh, cognitive impairment, cardiovascular symptoms of palpitations, uh, chest pains, muscle, musculoskeletal symptoms. And due to taking of excessive air, uh, air they, they get bloating and uh, abdominal distension. Uh, most of these features are due to heightened sympathetic activity uh, where your sympathetic, or sympathetic nervous system uh, prepares you for a fight or flight reaction uh, and these symptoms are likely to sustain inappropriate 
uh, sympathetic activ activation with the prolonged fight or flight uh, reaction. So there are sensory symptoms of vision, visual impairment, blurring, cognition, as I said before, and also motor incoordination. And mostly have most patients have uh, psychological impairment, anxiety, and also uh, they have uh, poor quality sleep. So these are data from patients who are referred for spirometry to our center. 123 patients post COVID were referred for uh, spirometry. On clinical assessment, using these tools of assessing dysfunctional breathing, uh, 11 had evidence of dysfunctional breathing. Le sorry, 21 had symptoms of, of dysfunctional breathing. 10 were males and 11 were females. Uh, we applied this 9 EGN questionnaire, which is a uh, 60, which has items of uh, on respiratory on respiration, CNS, and also uh, psychological parameters. Uh, out of a score of 64, uh, a grading of 0 to 4, a possible score of 64. If you score 23 out of the 64, uh, you ha you have you have it's suggestive of hyperventilation, with sensitivity of 93 and a specificity of about 96 percent. So out of these uh, patients who were assessed with this uh, for dysfunctional breathing, 16 patients who were assessed uh, demonstrated uh, a positive nine-ingen scores of more than 23. Again, we used the hospital anxiety and this, uh, depression scales, which also showed significant abnormalities. Most uh, patients scored about eight. Uh, these are tools to assess uh, anxiety and depression, which are coexisting with the states of dysfunctional breathing. Vocal cord dysfunction function, or where the vocal cords close inappropriately during inspiration and expiration, uh, causing restriction of movement of air in the throat. There are questionnaires which you can assess this, and this uh, quail item questionnaire with a grade, grading of five. If you score uh, with a possible score of 60, if a score fell or above, suggests that you have vocal cord dysfunction. Vocal cord dysfunction has been termed variably uh, as paradoxical vocal cord movement uh, and dysfunctional vocal cords, but uh, since sometimes the obstruction, this is, mind you, is a functional obstruction, not a structural obstruction, uh, since it can occur in the subglottic region also, uh, we have, this has been now termed as inducible laryngeal obstruction. So we see that vocal cord dysfunction also coexists in a significant proportion of patients, post-COVID patients who have dysfunctional breathing or uh, or or change disordered breathing patterns. So most of these patients in this cohort demonstrate a thoracic uh, dominant breathing pattern or apical breathing pattern in which the patients were using uh, accessory muscles of respiration and upper thoracic muscles. This can also cause hyperinflation and a degree of air traffic. Also, when you have uh, prolonged sympathetic activity, uh, it affects your diaphragmatic function, diaphragm becomes flattened and less, less mobile. Uh, so this also can lead to air trapping and hyperinflation and uh, the, your residual volumes increase and patient, patient's work of breathing increases. So uh, in, as I said before, uh, this is likened to a prolonged state of flight or fight with increased symp sympathetic system, nervous system activity. Uh, so this is basically a little on the physiology of breathing. Uh, it has higher cortical centers. Our breathing is on the volitional control. We can hold our breath, we can hyperventilate, we can change our breathing patterns uh, patterns uh, actively. Uh, and also there are various chemo and mechanoreceptors and various different and different pathways which contribute to our process of breathing and regulating uh, homeostasis in blood and blood pH. Basically what happens is disordered breathing patterns so dysfunctional breathing as we are, we are breathing in excess of our body's metabolic demands. We are breathing in excess of our blood, body's uh, metabolic demands and we are trying to get large volumes, large tidal volumes as much as three times the normal when we do sighing and deep breathing. So this causes our alteration in blood pH, CO2 levels that would impact function of peripheral and central chemoreceptors and reflex changes. Habitual failure to exhale fully as I said before and thoracic breathing causes air trapping and hyperinflation, uh, hyperinflated chest. Uh, sighing breathing can also lead to hypocapnia. Hypocapnia on the long run causes respiratory alkalosis and delivery of, uh, impairs delivery of oxygen at tissue level. This dysfunctional breathing, in spite of not being a, a disease process, can mimic, mimic many respiratory cardiac and neurological and musculoskeletal symptoms as I described uh, of extrapulmonary manifestations. So, as I said, this is likened to a state of high, high flight and of high response. 
it's been various various terminology in trying to define dysfunctional breathing but the definition i like best is this which says that dysfunctional breathing is a term describing a group of breathing disorders in patients with chronic changes in breathing in chronic changes in breathing pattern resulting in dyspnea and often not often non respiratory symptoms in the absence of or in excess of organic respiratory disease so organic respiratory disease have to be excluded and those who have organic respiratory diseases like asthma copd interstitial lung disease obesity the respiratory distress may be in excess and not explained purely by organic disease itself dysfunctional breathing can be uh, divided basically into thoracic dysfunctional breathing or extra thoracic dysfunctional breathing this can again be divided into functional and structural breathing structural dysfunctional breathing functional structural thoracic dysfunctional breathing uh, it starts with chronic nerve impairment diaphragm eventration of course extra thoracic dysfunctional breathing structural ones results from this subglottic stenosis uh, functional discuss functional thoracic dysfunctional breathing is what we are talking about and i'll describe this a little bit in more detail extra thoracic functional uh, dysfunctional breathing mostly implies vocal cord dysfunction so dysfunctional breathing patterns can be hyperventilation this is associated with shallow breaths uh, associated with respiratory alveolosis independent of hypocapnia or not it accounts only for about 20% of dysfunctional breathing uh, dysfunctional breathing but is the most studied pattern of dysfunctional breathing then there is deep sighing uh, dysfunctional breathing in which patient takes large tidal, tidal volumes as much as three times their normal tidal, tidal volume and this can be combined with hyperventilation there is also a thoracic dominant breathing pattern where patients are using their accessory muscles neck muscles and upper chest muscles uh, this can be a physiological response in asthma and copd but but when it's in excess of your phys physiological demands uh, it is termed dysfunctional breathing and some patients experience post abdominal expiration in which they say that they have to contract their abdominal muscles to force air out of their lungs and they suddenly there is a breath which escapes unnoticed and there also can be thoraco abdominal asynchrony in which the thoracic cage muscles and the abdomen does not work in synchron so what triggers dysfunctional breathing social situations uh, environmental stressors travels public speaking emotional stressors uh, and a variety of emotional issues can trigger dysfunctional breathing posture is very important stoop posture uh, mostly we see this in children who are online in front of their computers stoop and uh, stoop uh, we see uh, non covid related dysfunctional breathing also dysfunctional breathing also uh, non covid related dysfunctional breathing also uh, so we are seeing excess of these cases uh, symptoms during this period and i'm sure uh, you in clinical practice will also uh, be experiencing this uh, so these are uh, the post covid or long covid symptoms uh, uh, covid usually is uh, up to 4 weeks but 4 to 12 weeks is ongoing covid or ongoing symptomatic covid if it persists beyond 12 weeks it's term term post covid and the, the combination of ongoing symptomatic covid and post covid Uh, are term long covid so i'm only going to focus on pulmonary manifestations of uh, this long covid i'm not going to fo so focus on other syst systemic manifestations so a post exertional malaise or worsening symptom even after mind mind of physical activity or mental uh, exertion is also important uh, thing in the covid patients so what do we have what diagnostic do tools we have breath holding is important screening test in which you can ask the patient to hold their breath most of these patients are unable to hold their breath for more than 10 seconds on average it's about 6 to 8 seconds uh, you should be able to hold their breath for uh, about 30 seconds so there are uh, screening objective screening questionnaires like the nyvegen questionnaire the self evaluation of breathing questionnaire which i'll speak about a little later and the brompton breathing pattern assessment tool there are also objective measures like we use pyrometry 6 minute walk test mainly to exclude other pathology but cardiopulmonary exercise testing and capnography are also be useful useful diagnostic things the nymegen question i spoke about brief, briefly before we use it frequently in our patient to assess uh, for hyperventilation and look for other parameters that suggest hyperventilation a score of 23 out of 64 uh, then we uh, pick up covid uh, again self assessment of breathing breathing questionnaire which is a 25 item questionnaire which categorizes various patterns of breathing and based on uh, symptomatic symptoms that patients have explained uh is also a useful tool this is a self administered questionnaire where the patient describes their breathing patterns uh it uh, the it does not describe the psychological components of components of dysfunctional breathing as does the nymegen questionnaire the brompton breathing assessment tool uh experienced clinician or 
or physiotherapist asks the patients to relax for five minutes uh, and then for during a one minute period assesses the breathing pattern uh, the users use of accessory muscles if you observe the patients in clinical practice if you watch them silently in your practice you see that they are using the accessory muscles a lot they are they are sighing they are yawning they have demonstrating symptoms of air hunger so this tool assess parameters like their breathing pattern whether it's predominantly upper or lower chest whether they are, they are your inspiratory flow, expiratory flow, whether there is noisy inspiratory, inspiratory flow, suggesting upper thoracic or vocal cord obstruction. Uh, yeah, there are symptoms of air hunger. Patients have, this is a very important symptom. Patients complain of this also and demonstrate signs of air hunger uh, by taking deep breaths, uh, struggling to breathe, making effort, keeping their arms on their hips or their breath, and also yawning. So they, they, they demonstrate symptoms of air hunger. These are useful tools in clinical practice when we see these patients. Also, these patients ex 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 symptoms of restriction. Uh, so again, I mean, experienced experience physiotherapists can use, uh, demonstrate upper thoracic breathing patterns, chest breathing patterns, breathing patterns, uh, keep placing their arms on the chest as demonstrated. There are also other tools like uh, the pneumotechnography, induction plethysmography, in which uh, uh, various uh, abdominal bells can look at the thoracic and abdominal movement. So hyperventilation we spoke of, so I'm not going to spend much time on it. Again, this is a 59-year-old patient who had some abdominal surgery done for gastric ulcer, who presented with dysfunctional breathing. His uh, objective parameters, including spirometry, six-minute morphs were normal. In this patient, we want to have a cardiopulmonary exercise testing. Cardiopulmonary exercise testing is a very, very useful tool in, in which you can assess. The, basically, the patient goes on a, a cycle, a, a cycle, cy cycling, with uh, varying, varying exercise threshold as like with exercise CCG. In addition to that, pulmonary functions are also assessed via uh, gas exchange, carbon oxygen consumption, carbon dioxide uh, exhalation are measured. So where uh, various parameters are used and this nine plot Wasserman panel is used to assess various functions of uh, respiration. They can, we can look at cardiac reserve, pulmonary reserve, musculoskeletal reserve, anaerobic, anaerobic thresholds, uh, we can also look at breathing patterns and breathing pattern disorders in these patients. Uh, we can look up for deep conditioning. Uh, it's, to, it's a, a very useful tool, uh, and we uh, have this tool now um, in several se certain centers in the country. But we need the expertise, and we have respiratory uh, SRs who have trained overseas and who are bringing us new knowledge and new uh, technical expertise in these areas. So this has been a useful tool in assessing these things. So you see a, a disordered breathing pattern in these patients. They are hyperventilating, even from the before starting of the breathing patterns are very erratic. Larger tidal volumes are taken, as seen in this plot nine. And in plot four, you say that you see, you see that they are hyperventilating, and uh, they are, they are, their carbon dioxide levels, even before starting the test, is low, uh, suggesting hyperventilation. And how the test remains inappropriate to the body's physiological demands. Uh, capnography again a useful. Tool. Uh, the capnogram, demo, uh, as shown here, you can also. Uh, Use, the graph can also use to demonstrate breathing patterns, as said, in, as shown, demonstrated in this graph. Breath holding about a breathing force exhalation, gasping or struggling to breathe, can also be de demonstrated in this thing. And in educating a patient that the problem lies in a breathing pattern, demonstrating such a graph uh, sometimes itself is very reassuring, as the patient knows that there is help at hand, and the person and the clinician has been able to under identify the problem, whereas. Uh, she, the, the, he or she have been told that it's really no problem and this is all anxiety related. And so when addressing this issue, uh, the services of expert physiotherapists or physiotherapists ex experienced in uh, handling these patients are needed. They will treat these various breathing patterns, right, of mainly of diaphragmatic breathing, relaxation techniques uh, are taught to these patients. And also there might, there, there needs to be, they need to be provided with psychological support, anxiolytics and other medication may help. In conclusion, breathing pattern disorders are common in the post-COVID patients. It's more important that we understand this and we are able to observe and detect these patients and manage these patients appropriately uh, because uh, it is a, a heavy burden. At least five patients or six patients a day I see in practice with these breathing pattern disorders. Some are not related to COVID, but uh, the COVID environment and the stresses associated with COVID and changes in the lifestyle and the new norm has also led to uh, excess of these patients. So most patients are subjected to needless battery of tests. Some patients even have gone from angiography 
and uh, patients are sometimes labeled as uh, psychological uh, without a proper assessment and reassurance that there is a problem. Uh, patients are inappropriately pre pre prescribed medication, including a variety of inhaler, inhalers. Uh, sometimes, as I said, uh, awareness of these assessment tools and basic uh, bedside or clinical assessment tools uh, are very poor and access to specialized investigations like cardiopulmonary exercise testing and capnography is not available. And when it's available also, the proper uh, technical know-how and the skills to interpretation are not available. And also uh, knowledgeable physiotherapists, respiratory physiotherapists, uh, who are, uh, who, whom we work with constantly, whom we have the, uh, have, uh, who are, we, are, we are fortunate enough to have, uh, are able to also help us in managing this patient. So. Uh, I would like to say that uh, in, in addition to all the, the COVID patient also, as I said before, there are excess of uh, breathing pattern disorders in the non-COVID patients also. Uh, so once more, uh, I thank the Medical Society for inviting to speak and I'll be happy to answer a few questions uh, if there are any questions on this issue. Uh, and it's important to remember that changing your breathing can change your life. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for the excellent presentation on an important topic. So as we all know, already we are seeing a lot of patients with the breathing problem following COVID infection. And also, we, I'm sure we are going to see more patients with these problems in the future. Uh, please be online, sir. We will allow few questions at the end of the symposium. <music>
And uh, on the way back, we are very tired and we're talking about possibilities for starting PCR in particular, considering the plight of the poor driver who had to drop us and then when, had to go to Kandy to deliver the samples. So that time, we, there were no signs of possibilities. So we, we, were, we were not able to see anything at that, on that day. Surprisingly, the hot was on the same day evening, I received a call from the UGC chairman. Professor Sambat Amaratunga, he, he asked, will it be possible for you to start a PCR lab if I provide an RT-PCR equipment for you? It was a pleasant surprise. And then I immediately said, yes, sir. yes, I can. So Chiaman arranged an RT-PCR equipment from the Faculty of Agriculture, University of Peradeni for us. And the Vice Chancellor of the USL, Professor Ragel, helped us to borrow other necessary equipment from the science, technology, and healthcare faculties. All equipment were obtained via email communication with very minimal paperwork. Because why I'm saying and stressing is that because you know the difficulties in these are millions worth equipment, million rupees worth equipment. So then we just uh, and from one ministry, so one institution to other institution across the ministry, from one ministry to the other. So, but everything done within a few weeks, within actually within two weeks time, and uh, with very minimal paperwork, everything email. Our technical officers of the USL and support staff helped us to transport the necessary equipment to the hospital amid strict lockdown measures. We all remember, could remember that how strict the lockdown measures were in the early part. So but still, we, we had to uh, ca come through the hurdles. So um, the mixed reactions from the laboratory staff raising concerns of the biosafety, the moment we, uh, we declared that we are going to start the PCR lab, then they were scared. Because it's, it's natural, because it's pandemic, and, uh, uh, and the virus is new, and the test is new to us. And uh, they, were doubt, uh, they, they had several doubts whether is it safe enough. So, Dean of the Faculty of Healthcare Sciences uh, the, uh, and uh, Dr. Mayurudan, the both the chairpersons, they initiated a capacity building program to address the laboratory staff issues, which was really helpful. A nine member group of medical laboratory technologies, they volunteered to work at the PCR laboratory. Some health assistants attached to the lab, too, volunteered uh, to join us. So, we received a brief hands on training at the Candy Virology Laboratory. And we started COVID PCR testing on the landmark day, 24th April 2020, under the supervision of Dr. Rohit Mutugala, my dear friend, consultant virologist, Handy Hospital. So it was a fruitful collaboration of University Grant Commission and Ministry of Health through the Eastern University at the Teaching Hospital, particular. I'm really proud of it as a part of this, uh, uh, this collaboration. So, what did we detect? So we received the samples from the entire East Coast, from Mullatiba to Ampara. We detected positive cases from COVID returnees with very high viral load in May 2020. From July to October 2020, we continued testing of community samples with near zero positive rate. So that time we did pool testing. You all may have heard that word pool testing. So more than one samples in one reaction tube and we test as, as a pool. And then if there is any positives, then we need to individually testing that. So pool testing was possible when near zero positive rate was there. So in mid-October, we detected our first staff case linked to the Minuangoda cluster. So we tested all the possible contacts in the middle of the night, our staff, possible contact staff in the middle of the night, and submitted the report to the director in the early morning to facilitate her to decide on continuation of the service of that unit that was a labor room. So, so that that was uh, uh, so we 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 did our part to give that early report for the administration to decide what to do with that. So then, uh, in late October 2020, on the day the laboratory celebrated Navar Navaratri Puja, that was our annual uh, Vani Villa, we detected several positive pools from community samples from Balachi and Harbour at our evening run because we skipped the morning run because of the puja. And evening run, we detected several positive pools. So evening run red was around 10, 10, 30 in the night because it takes five to six hours, 10, 30. So when we shocked to see such much of uh, positive pools, it was the first cluster linked to Paleogoda in the East. 
So considering the importance, we were so tired. So at 10.30, we read the pool test. So considering the importance of the finding, our team decided to do testing at the middle of the night because we need to test individually and confirm the positive pools. We did it. And that timely results from our lab facilitated the public health team of the region and the national level to implement immediate lockdown measures at the Balachina Harbor. So in late November 2020, we detected several positive pools in community samples from Akarapattu, which was the first indicator of community outbreak in the Southeast region. So that while doing this PCR, 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 we were, uh, we, 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 we was, we were as Dr. Arumali correctly, correctly said, reviewing the science all around us. So then we came to know there is another mode of testing. So we were all about to go for that. So how did we rationalize? So we attended a hybrid meeting held at the Ministry of Health in late October 2020. Health Secretary chaired the meeting. Professor Malik Pires, our guru, attended the meeting as the field expert. So the cost effectiveness of PCR testing was extensively discussed. And Professor Pires strongly recommended rapid antigen tests for community screening. We took up that very strong. The COVID-19 rapid antigen test kit was brought to the country in November 2020. The first community screening using rapid antigen test was done in the east at Akrapattu market area. And we pioneered it, three MLTs from our PCR team and an academic of Faculty of Healthcare Sciences volunteered to come with me to conduct the first community screening using rapid antigen test in the east. So we performed a local validation of rapid antigen test and, uh, and then our study revealed overall sensitivity of the antigen kit was around 58.5% uh, and which increased to 79.4%, which is very important in people with high viral load. So specificity of this kit in our study was 100%. So interpretation of sensitivity of a point of care test, because this is point of care test, uh, should be done considering the purpose of testing. So point of care testing in COVID-19 is aimed to break the chain of transmission by detecting and isolating highly infectious individuals. So the turnaround time of a test is a key factor to achieve the success, contain, successful containment. So repeated testing on population with increased risk of transmission could be an effective strategy to prevent institutional outbreaks noted in the second wave of COVID-19 in Sri Lanka. So tests, for, tests with longer turnaround time with higher cost as real real time PCR will not be useful for repeated testing. Why we learned this? We learned this lesson because I I pointed out from from July to October 2020 we were testing community samples with near zero positive rate. We were testing and testing and testing, but we couldn't prevent the second wave hit the country. So why it went wrong? Because we didn't do the repeated testing of high risk population. So that is not possible with RT-PCR because of the cost, because of the turnaround time. So that is, uh, uh, that's, very, uh, that's a very important lesson we learned and we converted and we rationalized uh, the testing. So we facilitated point of care test. So when the rapid antigen test was introduced to the hospitals, confusion and conflicts rose on who to do the test, we had to do the test, who is responsible, but our team clearly understood it's a point of care test. And we visited our, our medical laboratory technologists, visited the RT, our respiratory trial unit and COVID unit, and to explain the test procedure. So our team extended its support to the peripheral hospitals as well as to establish rapid antigen tests as the point of care. So point of care tests have its own issues. So we too had it, so false positive cases. So we had detected an asymptomatic patient tested prior to transfer to Jeff for angiogram at the cardiology clinic. Then we had an asymptomatic postgraduate trainee doctor tested positive on arrival from an out district. An asymptomatic patient tested prior to a surgical procedure. An asymptomatic pregnant mother who was transferred from a local hospital with rat positive results found to be false positive. A trauma victim with, with intubated and on ambuing transferred from a local hospital with rat positive results. And we found out then and there, inquired into these cases and found out all are due to reading error of the street. And we worked out and we, we educated our, our, our team as well as the local hospital team, as well as the public health team, the proper reading of uh, um, uh, the antigen test kits. So um, our experience in field testing, what did we do with the field testing? So our MLTs again volunteered to support the public health team in conducting the field screening using rapid antigen tests, considering the timely, uh, the, the necessity. 
So large scale of asymptomatic random screening done among Batty Bazaar's shop workers in December 2020, and that was detected and, and detected early asymptomatic cases, and then that uh, that that that. That helped the public health team to implement issues and prevent uh, and the Christmas outbreak in the Batty, in Batty that time. And we conducted large-scale contact tracing at NTS, and then similar uh, similar contact tracing at Pulleyaradi and uh, Batty Clock Prison, and several other scale, uh, uh, asymptomatic screenings to prevent uh, um, uh, coming to transmission in Batty Clock, Kathanguri, and Badi all uh, with the help of our volunteer MLTs. So then, how, what about the health ministry support to the lab? Yes, the, the ministry supported us by providing three designated MLTs uh, uh, in, in November 2020. So Minister of Health provided the necessary equipment in January 2021 through the Health Enhancement Project funded by the World Bank. And with that support, we were able to return the uh, RT-PCR equipment we borrowed from the University of Peradeniya and certain other equipment we borrowed from the EUSL uh, with, uh, with, with our sincere gratitude. So the community support to the PCR lab. So um, during uh, mid this year, Dr. Deva Kandan, who was acting consultant microbiologist, uh, forwarded a request to the government, uh, our uh, di di district secretariat, through the director to arrange a public donation for purchasing certain equipment to increase the PCR capacity of our lab. So we received some valuable equipment through donations and which enhanced our capacity. The hospital support to the lab, without that, we were not able to start. So any team happily provided the space, including the designated space for the rabies control unit to expand the PCR lab. You all know we all are um, uh, the, the, the territorial, so we don't allow other people to come into our territory, but the any team happily provided the space uh, and including the rabies control unit for us. And hospital transport crew did a tremendous job from the very beginning to deliver the reagents and consumable on time. Happily, happily they did it. And hospital IT team, I should, I should remember them and their support as, as, as was invaluable. Hospital administration was always positive towards our request. So the take home message is that COVID-19 opened up a new era in diagnosis of infectious diseases in the East. So we never dreamt that we were able to start a PCR lab in the hospital within that short period of time. So it's a great example of true collaboration of Ministry of Health and UGC through the teaching hospital Batik Law and the Faculty of Healthcare Sciences, Eastern University. And rational use of testing facilities and correct interpretation of test results are the essential factors which determine the efficacy of any test. And I would like to uh, remember my school motto, they are to do right. Whoever, whatever says, if you know that you are doing the right thing, go ahead with that. And my dear team of MLTs, I want to share, this is, these are the nine MLTs and they, they volunteered initially and we were, we were honored by the uh, particular Rotary Club in uh, last, mid last year. And, uh, and these three people, uh, these three MLTs joined again as voluntary and later part. And these three, our dear uh, designated MLTs appointed by the uh, Ministry of Health and our dear uh, develop, uh, the data operator, uh, Ms. Hema, he was, uh, uh, she, she, she was uh, with us throughout. So thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Vaidehi, for taking us down a trip of memory lane, our memory lane and uh, <clears throat> congratulations to you and your team. And we are really lucky and blessed to have you amongst us during this COVID pandemic. introduce the next speaker, uh, who is not a stranger to us. Uh, she's Dr. Chitra Vamadhavan, and she'll be speaking to us on Miss C, What Are We Seeing? Uh, Dr. Chitra uh, is a graduate of the University of Jaffna Medical Faculty, and uh, <clears throat> she is uh, a consultant pediatrician of TH Baticolo, 
and she's a life member of the Baticlo Medical Association and a past president of uh, Baticlo Medical Association. She's a member of Board of Study in Pediatrics PGIM and regional member of Sri Lanka Association of Child Development. And she's a member of Child Protection Committee and Pediatric Skills Development Committee of Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians. And Dr. Chitra has been a pioneer of skill developing and uh, she's an ardent trainer of healthcare workers in the region in neonatal and pediatric care. So over to you, Dr. Chitra. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Angela, for the introduction. And thank you, Baticolo Medical Association team, for the opportunity. Uh, our symposium topic is combat and consequences. Now we are moving on to consequences. What we are seeing now, COVID-19 associated MISI. What are we seeing? I am going to touch uh, on introduction, epidemiology, pathophysiology, clinical manifestations and diagnosis criteria, setting of care and management, and finally, follow-up care in MISI. Introduction. As we all know, the active COVID-19 infection in majority of children are mild disease. Only very few are getting the severe form of active infection. But now what we are seeing is the consequence of mis uh, COVID, active COVID-19, that is multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. That is again a rare, but is serious. In introduction, that uh, first in April 2020, United Kingdom reported a series of uh, eight children who were presented with hyperinflammatory shock with the features of a typical Kawasaki disease. Then the other parts of the world also experienced the similar presentation of children. Then this new disease entity they identified and named as multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children by Center for Disease Control and World Health Organization. We should emphasize this is diagnosis of exclusion of other cause, causes of systemic inflammation and infections. Few points about epidemiology. As I mentioned, this is a rare but serious condition. One in 500 of children who are getting infected with active SARS-CoV-2, getting this MISI. And most of the children are previously healthy. They are relatively older and adolescents. The median age group is 8 to 12 years. According to definition, that is ranging from 1 to 21 years. The most common comorbidities uh, obesity and asthma. In Sri Lanka, we received or reported the first case in early 2021, but there is a possibility in 2020s also we have a couple of cases, but not identified and reported. Once we move into the pathophysiology, the studies shows the MISI is possibly due to the abnormal immune response to the virus. As we see the many children, when we are testing for SARS-CoV infection, most of them are having negative RET as well as the PCR, but they have positive serology. The clinical picture, similar to Kawasaki, disease, macrophage activation syndrome, and cytokine release syndrome. Even though the clinical picture is similar, the studies showed there are different immunophenotypes from Kawasaki and macrophage activation syndrome. As we all know, the myocardial injury is a prominent feature in MISC. The possible causes for myocardial injury, 
the study shows the systemic inflammation, acute viral myocarditis, hypoxia, stress, yep. cardiomyopathy, and coronary artery involvement. According to the WHO and CDC case definition criteria, the age group is 0 to 21. As we see, we see that is multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children. Nowadays, there are Miss A means adult, Miss N in neonates also detected. And there should be fever more than three or more than three days with elevated inflammatory markers, high ESR, CRP, procalcitonin, LDH, or serum ferritin. And we should exclude other obvious microbial causes, especially the sepsis, septic shock, any serious bacterial infections like leptospirosis, dengue shock syndrome, and some serious viral infections like cytomegalo, Eba virus, uh, by exclusion, then we are coming to the possible diagnosis of MISI. And there should be an evidence of COVID-19 as we are doing PCR and serology, as I mentioned, as this is a post-COVID infection, most of the children rat negative. Sometimes we are getting the PCR with the value of past infection and serology positive in most of the our admissions. Plus, there should be two or more clinical manifestations. Examples, some mucocutaneous GI is very, very common GI manifestations in MIC, cardiac, renal, hematological, neurological, and respiratory. Let us move on to the clinical spectrum. There are three varieties. The mild MIC we call as a febrile inflammatory state. The children presenting with the persistent fever with mild symptom, mainly GI symptoms, the abdominal pain, vomiting, they mimic acute appendicitis. And inflammatory markers may be normal or elevated with no evidence of shock, cardiac dysfunction, or Kawasaki disease phenotype. The second category is a moderate presentation we call as Kawasaki disease phenotype. They meet the criteria for complete or incomplete Kawasaki disease like fever, mucocutaneous manifestations, cervical lymphadenopathy, and peripheral signs with no evidence of shock or severe multisystem involvement. And the third category we call severe MSC. They present with shock with severe multi-organ involvement, with cardiac involvement, sometimes neurological or other renal uh, or respiratory involvement, but they are having significantly elevated inflammatory markers. As I mentioned, there is a significant overlapping between the phenotype uh, of Miss C and Kawasaki disease, we should know some key distinctions between these two categories. Miss C commonly affects the older children and adolescents, whereas Kawasaki affects infants and young children. Uh, GI symptoms are very, very common in Miss C. We also experience the same. Uh, uh, studies showed around 85 to 90 percent Miss C they present with the GI symptoms. And myocardial dysfunction and shock, the cardiac involvement mainly, uh, they have in MIS-C uh, myocardial dysfunction and shock, but in uh, Kawasaki disease, mainly the coronary artery involvement. And the inflammatory markers are relatively very high in MIS-C than the Kawasaki. Kawasaki also the inflammatory markers are high. When we move on to the setting of care, the treating clinician has to take very active role and they should take a decision for level of care of these children uh, as most of the MISI children need very close monitoring. That is very, very essential. And uh, 
As you all know, in the teaching hospital vertical, we don't have a pediatric ICU setup. Uh, all of the children admitted with Miss C in, uh, under the supervision of my unit, the pediatric unit 29 and 30, we managed in our ward setup. And the shock children we managed in the high dependency unit. And all six children recovered and we discharged successfully. So I would like to share the experience in managing and setting of care these children. And the need for isolation is, as we discuss, most of the children are presenting after two weeks of active infection. So we never isolated none of them. But the isolation, uh, need for isolation is depending on the CT value. We must thank our microbiology team, especially Dr. Vaidegi, uh, for the quick response and timely needed support to get very early PCR report with the CT value to decide whether isolation is necessary or not. And again, the multidisciplinary care is important, you may see mainly the team of pediatrician, cardiology, microbiology, as well as hematology, lab, and to get all investigations in an urgent reports. So we received uh, six children during the period from September to November. Um, the youngest one is four and a half year old female child, and the uh, other five children between the typical age group, 7 to 13 year old. And all three categories we received, one child, a 7 year old female child came with the mild category of Missy, just a fever with mild abdominal symptoms. And we managed according to the our guideline, she received uh, IVIG and aspirin and she recovered within a short period, and we discharged that child. And another two children, they are both are females. They presented with a moderate Kawasaki disease phenotype pattern. They presented with the non parallel conjunctivitis, rash, with the my, uh, mimic appendicitis, as I mentioned. This one of this uh, category child we received from the surgical unit. Child was admitted to the surgical unit for appendicectomy. Luckily, they noted that some eye changes are there, the, some conjunctival, conjunctival non parallel conjunctivitis, and they referred to us, and immediately we took over the child. We suspected we have to exclude Missy, and we managed uh, according to the guideline. Uh, and none of them have shock or multi system involvement but they have CRP, ESR, LDH, and very high serum ferritin levels. Uh, all, uh, both of them we excluded sepsis. We took blood culture, urine culture. One child undergone lumbar puncture also. CSF culture came as negative, and we have done dengue antigen, and send antibodies level for leptospira, Ebola virus, cytomegalovirus. But before the report says this child fulfilling the diagnostic criteria, we have started treatment once we receive the blood culture and the urine culture reports. Uh, as we are taking blood culture, urine culture, then we start broad spectrum antibody till we receive the culture reports. And these are few mucocutaneous manifestations. You can see they are mainly the strawberry tongue, and uh, peripheral changes in the hands and feet with the cracked lips and conjunctival, non parallel conjunctivitis. Uh, in this situation, we have to think about leptospira also, but there is said in leptospira, you can see the very deep uh, conjunctival suffusion here, the, just a mild inflammatory changes in the eyes. And how did we manage these two children? We admitted to the high dependency unit. 
and uh, monitor the vital signs and started broad spectrum antibiotic according to guideline kefataxim and vancomycin. But we didn't start vancomycin, we started kefataxin alone and closely monitored. And uh, all of these Kawasaki disease phenotype 2 plus our shock 3 children, uh, we could able to do the urgent echo. We should thank our cardiology team. The, they also helped us very quick and need, uh, urgent echo was done and we treated according to the guideline with immunoglobulin, methyl prednisolone, then uh, changed to oral prednisolone and Taylor regime. And we have started antiplatelet aspirin also in the uh, Kawasaki disease phenotype. And both of them recovered completely and we discharged and we are planning for the follow-up review. And we received three children with shock Really, that's a severe form. Out of six, the 50%, three children presented with shock to our unit. And one child really admitted, they admitted to the surgical ward with the acute ruptured, acute uh, ruptured appendicitis with septic shock. Because when you see that child in that situation with the scan findings, uh, child undergone appendicectomy, you can't... Uh, prevent that because that is a very emergency situation. You have to decide whether to do surgery or not, but child in, was in shock, but uh, ruptured appendix, the finding shows the child undergone appendicectomy, but the shock not uh, uh, persistently, the child having low blood pressure with the signs of shock. Then the next day morning, we uh, received the referral and we went and shock and immediately we managed the shock in the surgical unit and uh, discussed with the other team members and we took over the child immediately to the, our high dependency unit and managed the shock appropriately and uh, we have started the management according to our guideline and in, uh, immediate echo was done and this all three children having cardiac involvement also uh, one child have global dyskinesia with the low ejection fraction and heart failure, really. And uh, they presented with the very high inflammatory markers, as well as all three have elevated d dimers One child d dimer level uh, very high, more than 10 times higher than the normal side. This is our high dependency unit. I must thank our team who involved in managing all uh, children who were admitted to the high dependency unit very successfully. This is our uh, management for the severe form, initial stabilization, oxygen, fluid boluses, broad spectrum antibiotic, and take all cultures, and very close monitoring of vital signs. Started once the diagnostic criteria fulfilled, we started the regime methylpritney with the IV, immunoglobulin, and urgent echocardiogram. Even the non-official hours, we could able to do the urgent echocardiogram by our cardiology team. And we have started antiplatelet dose of aspirin, and enoxaparin dose, we had to start one uh, with the very high d dimers treatment dose, and the other child with the prophylactic dose. Uh, luckily, none of them having the features of refractory missy, and they never uh, received any second dose of IVIG or inotropes or any adju adjunctive therapy. All recovered nicely and we discharged all of them. Recently, we discharged one boy with a heart failure and we planned for the follow-up care also. And... Uh, the studies showed the resolution of systemic inflammation and cardiac dysfunction takes around six weeks. And, but a couple of children, they uh, having some long-term sequelae like muscular weakness, reduced exercise capacity, and some emotional disabilities. The uh, follow-up care, we should advise them, especially on uh, exercise restriction, 
and all should avoid strenuous isometric physical activities for minimum of eight weeks. And if they have cardiac involvement, they need minimum of six months uh, uh, restriction in exercise. Uh, we plan to review them at two weeks, six to eight weeks and 12 month period to review with the uh, all repeat investigations and decide on to be of aspirin uh, as well as the uh, inoxaparin also already we stopped and discharged mainly the aspirin dose. Uh, finally, I must thank uh, the Baticolo Medical Association for the opportunity and the thank of our whole team, the ward team members, the specially pediatric registrars, senior house officers, the intern medical officers, as well as the nursing staff, uh, and our healthcare assistants for supporting in managing all these children in our high dependency unit. Actually, we need a pediatric ICU setup. And the other multidisciplinary team, especially the microbiology and cardiology team for the timely support to manage these children. And really, two children with shock, I think they admitted to the COVID isolation unit because they gave the history there's a past infection or contact history. They suspected active infection and they admitted two children to the COVID-19 unit. Uh, then once we received the uh, information from admission uh, room, then our registrars immediately ran and assessed the two children. Both were in shock stage. One child really they managed as dengue shock in a peripheral hospital and then transfer. Overnight we informed microbiologist and we took over that child to the ward. We took some risk, but our nurses and doctors, everyone, okay, we clinical diagnosis is missing. No need to worry about the uh, COVID active infection. Then all managed properly, these two children. The other, ch other child also came with the shock to the COVID-19 unit. And within a couple of hours, we took over to the ward and uh, stabilized both of them. And they recovered nicely and went home. And finally, the Baticolo Medical Association, thank for this opportunity to sharing my experience. and. Uh, the med as we are medical professionals, we need some awareness uh, regarding the diagnosis of MIS-C and early identification, early intervention always save the life of these children. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam, for the excellent speech on a rare but very serious manifestation of another post-COVID syndrome. So we, all the physicians and almost all the pediatricians in our hospital has some experience about managing Miss C and also Miss A. So as the definition says, the age group up to 21 years, so physicians also getting patients with Miss C. And also I would like to warn the surgeons uh, because abdominal pain and vomiting with diarrhea is another common manifestation of Miss C. So when you have any um, suspicion about your acute surgical problem, better to get the medical opinion. Uh, I would like to invite the speakers to the head table for one or two questions because of the um, restrictions of time because we are already behind the shadow. Thank you all for the good, uh, excellent talk. This is to Dr. This is to Dr. Amita Fernando. Thank you, Dr. Amita Fernando, for helping us in managing some of our patients. And uh, my question is maybe a little deviating from your topic. The question is, um, now, oxygen therapy, of course, one of the most important uh, part of the treatment in, when it comes to COVID. But are we doing too much? Because yes, after listening to a talk yesterday by a consultant anesthetist, uh, the oxygen it's, itself, just like any other drug, can have more effect, uh, side effect, 
which has a worse ba outcome. So what is the target for COVID-19? Uh, uh, it's giving too much of oxygen to maintain for about 96 or 98 percent of uh, saturation. Is that really bad? Uh, uh, so what is the target oxygen uh, uh, saturation we should maintain? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, I think this is the issue that we should uh, seriously look at. Uh, in fact, we had our uh, sessions on pulmonology recently, and we had uh, speakers from overseas in the UK and other clinical, uh, uh, other uh, experts from Europe uh, on a critical care session in which these issues were highlighted. I think uh, the question that you raised is very pertinent. Are we doing too much? Are we expecting too much? Uh, so uh, I think target saturations in a patient who had COPD or underlying disease, lung diseases, we say uh, 92 uh, should be okay. I think targets of uh, 94, 95 is okay, but we have to take into other parameters into consideration, like their working work of breathing and things. Uh, and now after publication of re recovery respiratory support data, the tendency is more, toward, more uh, towards more on CPAP and respiratory support rather than high flow oxygen. Uh, nasal high flow oxygen, uh, na nasal cannula. I think sometimes achieving targets of 97 or above is a little bit unrealistic. And as you rightly pointed out, uh, by giving such high concentrations of almost 100% oxygen, we may do it, be doing more harm and uh, contributing more towards uh, these fibrotic processes. As, I, as we all know, uh, oxygen and um, can also be toxic and also can uh, lead to um, fibrosis and uh, other issue and lung injury. So I feel that we should be uh, revisiting these things, uh, have a more holistic approach and understand the pathophysiology of the disease and the disease process itself, uh, which is profound hypoxemia uh, and um, set our targets a little lower uh, as, you, as you have pointed out. Thank you very much, Dr. Amita. Uh, are there any more questions? In the absence of any other questions, I'd like to thank uh, all four speakers of the symposium, Dr. K. Arul Moli, Dr. Amita Fernando, Dr. Vaidehi Francis, and Dr. Chitra uh, Vamandavan for their excellent presentation and interesting symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Dear panelists and speakers, I would like to uh, request you to uh, stay uh, for a while uh, on the stage. And uh, for the, uh, to award the cert certificates of appreciation to the panelists of today's session, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. P. Mayruthan and Dr. Angela Arul Pragasan. And uh, even though not, they are not here with us at the moment, we highly value uh, the contributions by Dr. Vaidehi Francis and Dr. Amita Fernando. So at first, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. K. Arul Nidhi. Uh, and uh, Dr. Chitra Vamadevan. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon, Dr. K. Arul Moli. Thank you, sir, and Dr. Chitra Vamadevan. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And that concludes the first part of today's session. And uh, I hope that the uh, sessions to come. Yes, uh, and before and before that, uh, to award the certificates of uh, appreciation to the, to our panelists, I call upon uh, the vice president of Particular Medical Association, Dr. M H M Ashraf. First, uh, Dr. Angela Arul Pragasan. and Dr. P. Mayuruthan.
Thank you very much, sir.